uh, roll, please. Will do. Senator Wilk? Present. Senator Leva? Senator Roth? Here. Assemblymember O'Donnell? Here. Assemblymember Cunningham? Here. Assemblymember Burke? Juan Morales? Here. Daniel Kim? Here. Gail Miller? Here. Great. We, we have, have a quorum. quorum. Thank you, Jinx. Um, pursuant to Governor Newsom's executive order N2520, issued on March 12th, 2020. Oh my gosh, has it been that long? This meeting is being conducted by way of teleconference. It's physically webcast from room 6300 in the Ziggernaut building in West Sacramento for anyone that wants to provide public comment in person. In order for our meeting to run efficiently, please mute during the meeting. If a board member or the public would like to make a comment, please use the raise hand feature in the Zoom interface. And you do that by going to participants and then there's a little raise hand feature. And of course, if you're on the board, feel free to just raise your hand. If you're calling into the meeting and not using a computer or the Zoom app on a mobile device, you will be unable to provide public comment, but we will definitely make sure that you have, um, if you wanna send us anything in writing, we will use it for the record. Um, before we start, for, um, with our agenda item, we want to take a moment to present to Cesar Diaz and Assembly Member Adrian Nazarian with their resolutions. So Mr. Watanabe is going to share the screen and I'm, I have them here as well. They're actually beautiful. Mm -hmm. And first I'm going to present to Assembly Member Nazarian and acknowledge his dedication and service to the State Allocation Board. He was appointed by um, former Speaker John Perez in February 2013 and served through February of 2020, which I think may be the longest serving state allocation board member, right? Is that right? I think so, or assembly member. Um, he has assisted the board in making state um, apportionments and providing unfunded approvals for over $5.82 billion worth of projects for the school facility program and the other programs administered by the board. He helped shape policy that led to decision on such matters as providing the high performance grant funding for facility hardship and seismic funding and the implementation of the grant agreement. His concerns for equitably and transparently distributing Prop 51 funds throughout the state and project accountability have enabled the board to address some of the state's economic, financial, and climate conditions affecting all districts participating in the school facility program. So deep, deep gratitude to Mr. Nazarian for his work, his service to the students of California. You'll be happy to know, Mr. Nazarian, that we're even moving forward on our LA Unified Resolution. And we, so your, your presence is definitely felt as is your legacy. So thank you for your service and for everything you've done for the board and the students of California. And when we all go back to learning, they will do so safely because of you. I don't know, um, is it okay if we let Mr. Nazarian just say a couple words and then we'll move sure. to Mr. Diaz? Yes. Mr. Nazarian? I, thank you. I was gonna joke and say, I wanna thank the Academy since, <laughs> since it's just down the street from here. Um, but, uh, but thank you. I really, it's been wonderful working with the staff, with the rest of the board members and, uh, and on really accomplishing some cool things. I thought A, were necessary, but B, um, allowed us a, a bit of insight into the needs of uh, different areas in this vast state. So I uh, very much appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate the trust that uh, many of you placed and uh, uh, look forward to continuing my working relationship from the sidelines uh, as best as I can. And I appreciate the recognition. Yeah, well, we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I'm going to present Cesar Diaz with the resolution and his dedication of service to the State Allocation Board. He is longer serving, I apologize for that, was appointed by Governor Brown in May 2012 and served through the end of March 2020. And you had near perfect attendance, Cesar, only missing one meeting. So that's very impressive. Um, although I was chairing during that one meeting, so you get like missing at least three. Um, you assisted the board in making apportionments and providing unfunded approval 
for over $6.9 billion worth of projects for, um, for the school facilities program and other project programs administered by the board. You were instrumental in shaping policy that led to decisions on such matters as acceptance of funding applications once bond authority had become exhausted and the continued funding of schools on California military bases. Your concern for strict accountability of the prevailing wage monitoring program and the equitably and transparency of, dis of the distribution of Prop 51 funds throughout the state enabled the board to address some of the state's economic, financial, and climate conditions affecting all districts participating in the school facility program. And to you, we really thank you for your commitment, dedication, conscientious service, and personally um, mentoring me on this board. We're happy that you're still serving the people of California and the state Senate and very grateful for your time on this board. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. You wanna say uh, anything? Uh, yeah, just really quick. I, I, I wanna say that it was an honor to serve uh, with each and every one of you, and especially with the staff, the hardworking staff of the um, of OPSC and the state board. Um, we did a lot of great things and hopefully it's gonna be smooth sailing for the next bond whenever that happens, because it's mm -hmm. gonna happen. And so I, uh, I am very thankful for that opportunity uh, to work with you and, and others, Gail, and I, I appreciate this uh, recognition. Thank you. Well, we really are very grateful to you. And um, Cesar, I know you'll be back in the building to get this resolution is really beautiful. And, and obviously, um, OPSC does such an incredible job. So if, if you can come by and get it. And Mr. Nazarian, just have um, anyone on your staff coordinate. They're in my office on the first floor in the Capitol. So thank, thank you both you very much children. for your service to the children thank you. of California. <laughs> Have a good day. Yay. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Um, okay. So Senator Wilk, I literally made it in less than 10 minutes last time, actually, when you had less than perfect attendance. I just want you to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the minutes for August 28th. Are there any public comments? Mr. Watanabe, you don't see anyone, right? Not on chat, no. Okay, great. May we have um, a motion and a second to approve the minutes, please? So moved. O'Donnell moves. O'Donnell moved by, um, Mr. O'Donnell, seconded by Senator Wilk. Lisa, will you call the roll, please? Will do. Senator Wilk? Aye. Senator Roth? Aye. Assemblymember O'Donnell. Aye. Assemblymember Cunningham. Aye. <clears throat> Juan Morales. Aye. Dan Kim. Aye. Thank you. And this is our, This is oh sorry. Oh hi, Miss Burke. Do you want to yeah, sorry want to vote on the minutes? Thank you for joining us. Aye. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And Gail Miller? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Great. Thank you very much. Ms. Silverman, your executive officer statement. Yes, we have a few things to share. Um, we wanted just to highlight a few um, items. So we wanted to um, mention that the extending the emergency powers uh, of the executive officer during a state of emergency, this is an item that we have as an action item tonight. So uh, we'll cover that uh, item, but basically uh, the current emergency due to COVID that provides districts the opportunity to extend their deadlines, um, that does sunset in February. Uh, and recognizing that we would have to submit another regulation package, um, we thought it would be prudent to um, make some changes to that, and we'll address that as part of the action item. And then the second item we wanted to address, as Gail mentioned, um, in our uh, comments to Adrian Nazarian was uh, the facility hardship amendments um, related to the seismic mitigation program and the overhaul of the facility hardship program. Those uh, regulation amendments were approved in May and those are now in effect as of August 31st. So that's great news for the program. A lot of effort uh, put into that. Brings, and it'll bring some streamlining to the program. And again, we've actually been receiving some applications, so that's great news. Um, so we're looking forward to process those applications in a more streamlined effect. Um, we've actually wanted to give the board some updates as far as the time extension requests from districts as it related to COVID. Um, we've actually received, as of September 10th, 
291 requests for an extension. And again, um, there's probably just a few out of the outset that have been denied, but most of those outsets of those extensions been denied. It's been normally where we're working with districts um, or that maybe the request have been maybe a little too soon. So again, we'll, we'll continue to work with districts, but again, we just want to give the board some updates related to the extension request. And again, it shows and it reflects that we are understanding the district's needs in this area. Um, and we, again, want to highlight this online um, extension request. Again, it is available online, so please, we encourage you, if you have any needs, please do that online. Uh, we also wanted to highlight at the August 28th board, um, we had the party funding round certification apportionments closed at August 28th, but we also wanted to share, we received $964 million in certifications and so that means that from July 1st through December 31st, for those projects that submitted certification that you'll be eligible for the fall bond sale. Well, guess what? Next month, we'll be presenting those projects um, as a result of the fall bond sale for apportionment. So that's great news. Next month, we'll have some huge apportionments to take forward. So again, all these projects will be covered. So thank you again, districts, for submitting your certifications. And then the next item is highlighting, this is another action item on the agenda. We'll be presenting to the board the last filing round for career tech, and we're asking the board to approve $287 million. So again, those are unfunded approvals once the board takes action on that. And again, they have the ability, these projects will have the ability to submit during the next uh, priority funding round, and that opens up in November. And with that, the next board meeting is October 28th at four o'clock. I'll open up to any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Silverman or public comment? On chat. Great. Alrighty, moving on. We will now go to the consent calendar, please, Ms. Silverman. Consent is ready for your approval. Great. Any public comments or questions on the consent calendar? Moved. Second. Moved by, was that Mr. Okay. By Mr. Cunningham. Right. Oh, sorry, by Mr. Morales. Okay, Ms. Jones, do you want to go ahead with the roll, please? Will do. <clears throat> Senator Will? Aye. Senator Roth? Aye. Assemblymember O'Donnell? Aye. Assemblymember okay, thank you. Assemblymember Cunningham? Aye. Assemblymember Burke? Aye. Juan Morales? Aye. Dan Kim? Aye. Gail Miller? Aye. Motion carries. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to financial reports, please. Yes, on page 56, um, we wanted just to highlight some of the fund release activity. Um, we had, a, again, a large spring bond sale as well, and we just wanted to highlight on $148 million did get dispersed in August. So again, we are definitely providing uh, cash to the districts, and again, we're looking forward to providing some fund releases in the next few months as we result in the, the fall bond sale. Um, on page 58, we definitely want to highlight, um, although we the board will take action uh, related to the career check items, there are 17 projects that re represent $25.7 million in project approvals that are part of the consent agenda. And there are also a few adjustments related to uh, full day kinder and that represents $400,000 as well. And five closeouts related to $87,000 in projects uh, returning the funds as well. So that's part of the consent agenda. So that's what we have to highlight today. Great, thank you very Any much. Questions? Any questions from the board or public comments? So Mr. Watanabe, you'll tell me if anyone's raising their hand in Zoom, right? Sure, yeah, okay. I'll let you know. Thank you for that. Um, great, seeing none, thank you for that. And that's really exciting. That's some good news for a change. Um, okay, we'll move on to appeals, seeing that there's no questions. We'll start with the Greenfield um, appeal, please. Ms. Kempminer. Yes, so that starts on page 77 of our agenda today. 
And this is related to a full day kindergarten program application that the district did receive approval for back in May of 2019. And there are two requests for the board's consideration. One is a change of scope and the second is a timeline extension request. When the district originally received its approval, it had envisioned some classrooms, nine classrooms that they wanted to retrofit and make suitable for full day kindergarten use. Um, as the district was embarking on the design process, they were taking a look at the campus and looking at the master plan and determined that it would actually be better to locate the kindergarten classrooms in a different area of the campus, which would actually be more in alignment with the CDE Title V requirements as well. So um, they're requesting to be able to change the location of where the work is being done. However, in developing this design for the new location of the classrooms, the district did um, have some delays in completing the design work. And in May of 2020, when the application was due to move on to the next phase of funding, the district was not quite ready because the plans had not yet been submitted and approved by the state architect or by the Department of Education. So in order to actually move forward with this project, the district is requesting an extension to do so um, to be able to submit their fund release by June 30th, 2022. Staff has reviewed the request and from the change of scope perspective, we have absolutely no issues with the uh, change and where the district would like to do the work. It doesn't require any additional bond funds. It's still within the original intent of the project in order to retrofit those nine classrooms. So we have absolutely no objections there. Um, and we also support the district's request for the time extension. The district does still have a need for these full day kindergarten classrooms. Uh, yes, it was a little slower than uh, perhaps it could have been. The district did not meet the deadline. However, we feel that it would be best to keep the funding with the original applicant in this case because uh, we don't have a, multiple rounds going on of this funding. There's not really an opportunity to apply again. So if the district is not su successful in this appeal, it will not be able to move forward with the project at all. So we are recommending approval of the district's request to change the scope and extend the timeline to June 30th, 2022. Um, and with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. And I understand Greenfield UESD is um, calling in to answer any questions, but they're not speaking. Um, so if we have any questions for the district, we can ask them now. Thank you for joining, we appreciate it. Any questions from the board or no? Any public comment, Mr. Watanabe? Nope, none. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I would say to the district, thank you for being here to answer questions. Probably not necessary to speak. Um, may we have a motion and a second? O'Donnell moves. Running out a second. Moved by O'Donnell, seconded by Mr. Cunningham. May we take the roll, please? <clears throat> Senator Wilk? Aye. Senator Roth? Aye. Assemblymember O'Donnell? Aye. Assembly Member Cunningham. Aye. Assembly Member Burke. Aye. Juan Morales. Aye. Dan Kim. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. Great. Motion Thank carries. Le Lisa Senator Olivia joined the meeting too. Thank you. I was just going to say that. Okay. Oh, thank you, Senator, for joining. Really quickly, Senator, why don't we just go back through and have you, we'll open the roll for a few items for you, and then we'll get to the Pioneer Appeal. So, Thank um, you. On the minute, Senator? Aye. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. And on the consent agenda? Aye. Thank you for that. And then the Greenfield USD um, appeal, the staff recommendation was to support the appeal to move to Janu uh, June 2022. Also, aye. Great. Thank you very much. With Thank the you very much. much. That appeal passes. And now we will move to the Pioneer appeal, please, Ms. Kent Miner. Yes. So our next appeal uh, for the board's consideration starts on page 88 of the agenda. And it is from Pioneer Union Elementary, which is a small school district in Kings County. Um, I'll provide a staff presentation and the district is on the um, meeting today and uh, would like to provide some comments as well. The request from the district is to base its new construction eligibility on an enrollment year other than the year in which the application was processed and specifically it's uh, the 2013-14 enrollment year. 
And the application that is the subject of this appeal is for a new construction project to replace 12 portable classrooms at Pioneer Elementary School. It received, this project has received approximately $297,000 in state funds um, previously um, based on the 18-19 eligibility because there was a, a, a tiny amount of special day class pupil eligibility that was available to the district. However, the district is seeking an additional $3 million in funds based on eligibility that could have been generated if the past year enrollment projection was used. Uh, the timeline for this application begins a number of years ago and actually begins with the submittal of the new construction eligibility update, which was received in 2014, October of 2014. And that update did use the enrollment information from the 2014 school year, and it was a 10-year projection based on um, enrollment patterns at the time. At the time the eligibility was submitted, we were in the times where we had exhausted bond authority and the, the board had decided that application processing would not continue until the future of the program was known. So the uh, application materials were received but not processed. And the funding application was then submitted in October 2016. This was still during the time when we were out of bond authority and the application was submitted to the applications received <laughs> beyond bond authority list. Uh, which required districts to include a school board resolution acknowledging several factors, which um, we've actually highlighted on page 90 of the agenda, and include in part that the bond authority is currently exhausted, future state funding was not guaranteed, the criteria for applications in the future may be different, and that if districts opt to move forward, they do so at their own discretion, and the state um, has no responsibility for that. Now, if the SFP had funding back during this time period and if applications were moving forward, the district would have used the eligibility projected by the 13-14 enrollment information under what's referred to as the small school district three-year lock. And this three-year lock allows small school districts to use eligibility for a period of three years without having to update again. Um, and that's three years after board approval. So that October 2016 submittal date, um, again, assuming that there was the that there was bond authority and the ability to process applications, that October 2016 submittal date could have fallen within that three-year lock window um, back at that time. However, that is not what occurred during that time, unfortunately. Uh, Proposition 51 did not pass until November 2016, and it was across several meetings in 2017 where the board was discussing Okay, the bond is passed, we've got this list of projects that uh, were received beyond bond authority and the question was being determined, well, how do we handle these lists? What, how do we move forward? What do we do? The board ultimately decided at its June 5th, 2017 meeting that these projects could move over to the workload list. They would maintain their date order received. But for new construction projects, the new construction eligibility must be current at the time that a new construction funding application was processed. And that was done in order to maintain the integrity of the bond funds and to ensure that it was in keeping with voter intent of building classrooms for unhoused students for districts that did show uh, a demonstrated need. So regulations were put into place for that. And since 2017, all districts with new construction projects have been required to provide these eligibility updates in the year in which they're processed. The board did talk about the three-year lock for small school districts back during this time period, but it was always prospective. It wasn't looking backwards. It was whether or not they could have that three-year lock, which could still happen. That's still in the regulations, but prospectively not based on the prior year's enrollment information. So at about the same time the SAB was having these discussions in 2017 to determine how to start the pro uh, program back up again, the district opted to move forward with the project and did issue some construction contracts. And the district has provided some information that indicates that this was to align the project with an additional modernization application that was also uh, occurring at the same site. Uh, the modernization work was funded under a separate application and state funds were released for this project in July of 2020. The district has completed the work for both the new construction and the modernization at this campus in 2019 through a combination of local bond funds and some funding that was um, obtained through use of a certificate of participation, the COP instrument that was taken out in anticipation of receiving future state funding. 
Uh, the district's new construction application was being processed in 2019 and was subject to new construction eligibility that was based on the 2018-19 enrollment year. However, the enrollment projections from that year resulted in negative eligibility. There's a chart on page 93 of the agenda that shows the enrollment projection trends over the years. And you can see on that chart that the 2013-14 the enrollment was um, projection was really kind of the last time period where you can see any sort of projected growth. Uh, that projection was uh, using a 10-year projection method and the mechanics of that is that it leans a little more heavily on the years that were um, further back as opposed to the years that were more recent compared to the current enrollment. So sometimes it can present some trends that have started to taper off or stop at the district level. And um, so what happened is that when the 1819 projection was completed, the those trends had not continued. So 1819 did not share the same pattern because the district was not experiencing the growth patterns that it had been in years past. Um, so we had also taken a look and talked to the district about because we were actually nearing the time when 1920 enrollment information would be available. And the district has indicated that the 1920 enrollment patterns also did not result in any increase in uh, eligibility and given just the time frames for this appeal we've had sort of an informal opportunity to see what enrollment looks like for this school year. Obviously um, COVID attendance patterns are impacting that but um, 2021 has not resulted in an increase in enrollment either. The district has um, talked to OPSC and referenced in the appeal some new dwelling units, new housing units that were going to go in in the district that were expected to bring new students. Now the program does contemplate this scenario and eligibility can be supplemented to account for this. However, the dwelling units have to be supported by track maps. And we were able to use 693 new dwelling units to augment the enrollment projection because those were able to be verified. But even with the 693 added, the eligibility projection was still negative. Um, and we were unfortunately not able to use any additional dwelling units because they were not far enough along in the process to be accounted for under the program criteria. So staff does not support this appeal um, because there are no current scenarios um, using current enrollment that would provide the district with sufficient new construction eligibility uh, to allow us to provide more grants than the SDC grants that were already provided for the project. Um, on page 96, you can see that the district had received the 297,000 for just the straight SDC grants. That amount will be adjusted to a little over a million dollars in state funding, regardless of the outcome of this appeal, because they can get the state, uh, the SDC grants plus some site development costs and supplemental grants that are added on to the um, pupil grants that they did receive. However, the district is requesting an additional 3 million in K-6 grants based on that 1314 enrollment projection, and we do not support this. The board has heard six prior appeals related to using eligibility in a different uh, enrollment year than that in which the application is being processed. For five of those appeals, staff has recommended that the board support, and these are for districts that are using um, even more current eligibility. So perhaps they were processed in 1819, but during the appeal process, they didn't have anything in 1819, but during the course of the appeal, the 1920 information became available. And using the 1920 information, they did demonstrate that they had an enrollment need. And that makes sense because it's even more current information than what we had at the time of the original application. So we have um, supported those appeals and the board has also supported those appeals. However, we have also had one additional appeal back in February of 2019 that was denied, that was requesting to use eligibility from a different enrollment year, and that was for Pleasant View Elementary School District. Pleasant View was in very similar circumstances as Pioneer. Uh, they had also opted to move forward on a new construction project while their application was on the applications received beyond bond authority list, so they were um, using older enrollment projections and assuming that that outcome was going to be okay in the future. Um, and that's, that's not what worked out for them. So the current year enrollment projections did not end up resulting in any positive new construction eligibility. So they also appealed and the board did not grant that appeal. So they did not have their project funded. It was also constructed. They were in the facilities. They had also taken out a COP to front fund the project. Um, but if, um, 
but that appeal was not approved. Um, the, the other piece to this is that there are other districts for the past three years that have been relying on the requirement to update for new construction eligibility. So any number of districts that have come through on the consent calendar, there are those that have had to change how they report their eligibility, break out into high school attendance areas to generate eligibility. Some folks have withdrawn their applications or had their application returned due to lack of sufficient eligibility. Others have had to reduce the pupil grant request to be in alignment with the eligibility that is current. Um, and this is all as a result of changing enrollment patterns within the district. So it is unfortunate that the district is in the situation of having to cover the debt service that they were expecting to um, cover with funds from the state. However, we are very concerned that approving this appeal would be inconsistent with the board's direction in 2017, uh, be inconsistent with how things were being handled for the past three years, um, which would be inequitable to other school districts. And it would also be inconsistent with the board's action on the Pleasant View appeal requesting to use the prior year eligibility. So for those reasons, we do not recommend approval. With that, I'd be happy to address any questions or as I mentioned, the district is available on the meeting. Great, thank you, Ms. Kempminer. This is a tough one because, um, and that was a really great explanation. So I appreciate you taking the time to talk about where we are. Um, I, I understand Mr. Paul Van Loon, the superintendent of Pioneer is on to address the board. I'll have you address the board, please, Mr. Van Loon, and then we'll go on to other public comment. If you could just state your name for the record, please, sir. My name is Paul Van Loon. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board. Um, as stated earlier, I am superintendent of Pioneer Union Elementary School District. Um, first, the district requested, uh, Pioneer Union Elementary School District presented two considerations for its appeals. First, the district requested funding appeal to that of the revised 2014-13-14 application. And second, as an alternative, the, that the board allow the district to establish its eligibility on the 2020 CBEDS enrollment. So regarding the district's request that the board consider funding equal to that of the 2013-14 application, it is recognized that the revised regulations uh, the board implemented in June of 2017 requires districts to establish eligibility when the funding application is submitted. This regulation appears to be uh, negatively impacting small districts such as ours, and as demonstrated by the impacts of the regulation on the following districts. Ross Valley, a district of 2,240 students, lost $2.4 million. Pleasant View, a district of 474 students, lost $4.5 million. And Pioneer, a district of 1,578 students, would lose $3 million. So this regulation appears to have very little impact on the state school facilities program, but has large implications for smaller districts and programs offered to students. Our project is a case in point. The project was a combination of modernization and new construction with a total project cost of $17 million. The project was paid for with a $7 million local bond developer fees, state contribution of $3.3 million, and with a certificate of participation. The state's portion of the project is only 19.4%. Should our appeal be granted and an additional $3 million be awarded, the state's portion would then only be 37% of the project costs. So considering the district's alternate request, to base the eligibility on the 2020-21 CBEDS enrollment as an alternate consideration. We appreciate the efforts uh, by the staff of OPSC in, in considering this information and its request and recommendation to the board. However, um, I believe the board recognizes the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on public school enrollment and particularly the decline in transitional kindergarten and kindergarten enrollment, which is a trend statewide. Parents choosing are choosing to delay their child's start in public education because kindergarten education is non-compulsory. And 
they don't want their child's first experience in public education to be with distance learning and with a teacher that their child has not established rapport with. So again, this is a trend within our district, within our county and statewide that kindergarten enrollment is on a decline. Our current enrollment shows a loss of 30 students in TKK compared with the previous years. So the fact remains, despite the calculations, the district does believe that it, had it not been for the COVID-19 pandemic, there would have been sufficient growth in enrollment to demonstrate increased eligibility. So in conclusion, I wanna thank the board for its serious consideration of this appeal and the circumstances surrounding the district's case. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions from the public? Any questions from the board? O'Donnell has one. Yes, please, Mr. O'Donnell. Okay, thank you. And I, I appreciate the superintendent uh, uh, being here to, to make his case. Listen, I didn't support the regulations, the changes that got us here today, the changes and requirements, but the board did adopt them and the rules are the rules. So, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to that. Um, just a question. If, have you paid off your, your, uh, your COP yet, or will you be able to pay it off if you do not receive the additional funds? Uh, we have not paid it off. It is a 30 year, um, commitment by the district. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a sidebar. I just want to express my concerns about districts using COPs. I get that they're in a bind, but I just, sometimes I worry that they're gambling for for dollars that might not come. And I'm not saying you did this in this situation. I'm just, I worry about that across the state. But that, that's another issue. That's not why we're here. That's not what we're here today to discuss, but your district is in positive financial status. Is that correct, sir? It is. Uh, again, um, with looking at the deferrals by the state and particularly the um, economy and the impacts on 2021, it does present impacts to our educational program. Great. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple, any other questions or public comment? Mr. Kim, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Superintendent Van Loon, my understanding is that the uh, school board had to make a resolution acknowledging the risk when applying for funding uh, for the program when there was no bond authority available. Uh, is that correct? It is correct, it, and uh, that resolution was based on the information and the trends that we anticipated growth. Okay, but at that time, weren't the, the past four years uh, showing that the enrollment growth was going down in each of those four years? Yeah, it, it, that um, it, it did, uh, but in consideration of the development that has been um, happening within the district, as mentioned earlier, we have uh, tentative track maps for 693 homes. Uh, it was uh, a reasonable um, assumption that the growth would uh, rise and increase. And was that reasonable assumption based on the advice and consultation from your pay consultant? In combination uh, with that and taking other considerations and in, in, into consideration, yes. Seems like a very... Uh, aggressive risk to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Um, so just a couple of comments, Mr. Van Loon, and I do appreciate you being here. And believe me, I have been a huge advocate of small school districts. Um, and I do, I think that the issue around these, the, the current regulations, as Mr. O'Donnell said, have been in place for three years. And I, I do think we are obligated to, to really require consistency. I, I do want to kind of clarify that despite how, how all of us have been impacted by COVID and completely hear what you're saying about kindergarten and in-person learning, and I'm living it myself and have a huge amount of sympathy, the numbers, you know, we didn't run the numbers. We, COVID wasn't necessarily what all that contributed to your enrollment. And I do just want to clarify that for the record, completely understand how, how this enrollment regulation that the board supported is is a little bit complicated but but it is what the the board has chosen to do we have not approved other appeals in the past and 
I do appreciate the vice chair's willingness to, to really be consistent in that way. Um, we did um, reject the appeal from Pleasant View and the circumstances were really similar in other small school districts. So we certainly um, would like to continue to work with you and, and hope that, that you do manage your way out of this crisis and as we move forward continue to work together um, depending on where the board is but do appreciate you being here and just wanted to make those those two clarifying points just around consistency and enrollment just to make it clear that it's not all COVID related but um, any other questions or public comment so the staff is not recommending support but I do want to make sure we know whether or not there's a motion to support the pioneer appeal So there's no motion to support the Pioneer Appeal. And um, again, please let us know how we can work with you, Mr. Van Loon, and thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for the board's time. Yeah, thank you, take care. So we'll move on now, Ms. Silverman, to item, the um, career tech item, please. Yes, um, can you draw your attention to page 111? So we wanted to present to the board the unfunded approval for the six uh, career tech funding cycle. So with Proposition 51 um, that provided $500 million for the Career Tech Education Program, and we had cycles four and five that presented uh, $125 million in each of the cycles. So this last, last cycle was $250 million, and the board set that in June of 2019. Also um, with that cycle, the board also created um, that opportunity of once we do accept the applications, that uh, we would keep the applications to a certain date and that would be December 31st of 2021. Um, that we have an attachment A1, we wanted to present to the board $287 million worth of projects um, that represent 178 projects. Um, this is a, definitely a competitive filing round. We had over 249 applications that had a score of 105 or higher and that represent over $427 million. Uh, with the timelines um, that we had and due to COVID, we just we did extend the timelines for the funding applications recently and extended that to, to the end of June, June 30th. So likewise, instead of having the timeline sunset December 31st, we wanted to hold the applications to June 30th of 2022. And with that, we also wanted to share with the board uh, we still have $792,000 of residual funds from the Career Tech program, but that doesn't fully fund the next project in line. And so by keeping the applications and hopefully with residual funds coming in, this will provide an opportunity to continue to fund the next project and hopefully fully fund the next project. And again, as funds become available from the Career Tech program, we can fully fund the next project. So with that, I'm asking the board to provide, approve the recommendations to approve attachment A1 for the uh, $286 million worth of projects uh, for um, 170 projects and also extend the filing cycle and keep those applications to June 30th of 2022. And with that, have any questions? Open any questions. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Um, any questions? Any public comment? No. Nope. No comments. Great. Thank you. Um, may we have a motion to approve the staff recommendation? Move so moved. Please. Moved by Senator Leva, seconded by Mr. O'Donnell. Ms. Jones, will you take the roll, please? Certainly. Senator Wilk. Aye. Senator Leva. Aye. Senator Roth. Aye. Assembly Member O'Donnell. Aye. Assembly Member Cunningham. Aye. Assembly Member Burke. Aye. Juan Morales. Aye. Dan Kim. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. Great. Good. And that motion carries unanimous. There will be a lot of happy people. Thank you very much. And now I know you already spoke about this, but um, if we could do move on to the emergency powers of the executive officer during COVID. Yes. So I um, just wanted to highlight, I, I know we covered this briefly, but um, I know uh, just during the recent pandemic, uh, we, the board did enact regulations um, during this emergency to adopt 
the, the executive officer, the ability to provide extensions to school districts and seeing how the regulations would sunset in February and COVID is going to obviously going to extend beyond this timeline. So, and now we're facing another, other natural disasters. So it made sense to make some regulatory amendments um, to go beyond COVID-19 and for any stated emergency declared by the governor of the state. Um, so those are the amendments attached, um, but also make that a permanent regulation. And so we're seeking the board, the, um, to adapt those regulations um, and also adopt them on an emergency basis. And also continue the process of submitting those online requests to our office. We'll be transparent about what we're gonna extend, what timelines we're extending. And again, make that very transparent of what we're gonna be uh, approving as far as districts request to extension. So again, we're asking the board to approve attachment B and adopt those amendments on an emergency basis. Great, thank you. And you'll report to the board which ones you extend. You'll continue absolutely. to do that. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any questions from the board? Any public comment, Mr. Watanabe? No comments. Great, thanks. May we have a motion and a second then on um, approving the emergency regulations to extend? So moved. Moved by Senator Leva. No second. Seconded by Senator Roth. Ms. Jones, will you call the roll, please? Yes. Senator Wilk? Aye. Senator Leva? Aye. Senator Roth? Aye. Assemblymember O'Donnell? Aye. Assemblymember Cunningham? Aye. Assemblymember Burke? Aye. Juan Morales. Aye. Dan Kim. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. And that is also a unanimous approval of the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think, are we moving on to our last, almost last item, second to last item? Um, Ms. Camp Minor? Yep. So we have one more action item for the board's consideration beginning on page 302 of your agenda. And it relates to a school district's use of surplus site sale proceeds. Um, and this is in response to legislation that was recently passed that allows school districts to sell surplus property and use the funds for one-time purposes in the general fund. Um, we did see a similar program back during the fiscal crisis about mm, a little more than 10 years ago, back in 2008-09. Um, and the provisions look very similar to what we're seeing today. Um, the statute actually really nicely lays out what a school district needs to do if they would like to uh, use the flexibility that's provided by the statute and deposit the proceeds into the general fund. But we do have a regulation change for the board's consideration just to clarify uh, the definition of what a one-time expenditure is versus ongoing expenditures. Now we already have these definitions because the ed code right now under 17462 does allow for site sale proceeds to go into the general fund under certain provisions. Um, so we thought that this would make the most sense to just go ahead and incorporate this new ed code section 17463.7 into the, the definitions that are already existing because the uh, definition doesn't change basically. So the regulation change is actually a very minor addition, but we think it will help provide clarity because back when the flexibility existed the first time for this option, we did get some questions from districts on what constituted a one-time expenditure. So we thought we'd just go ahead and do that. Also, the item does lay out the process for school districts on what they need to do to submit a request to, to take advantage of this option. Um, and that is on the item. It's also been listed on the OPSC website so that school districts can uh, find that and see how to participate. And for those districts that are taking a look at what, what is the best option for their district or their particular site, on page 304, we've provided just a brief comparison chart of the provisions that are uh, tied to Ed Code Section 17462 in comparison to the new law. And probably the biggest change from a school facility program standpoint is that if they're using the new provisions, then they are not prohibited from participating in the school facility program. So 
This can be a good option for districts. We will be doing an email blast to let folks know the outcome of the regulations um, once we have action from the board. And then we will also be incorporating this into our presentations when we go out to county offices and school districts. Uh, well, not go out to, but through, through our virtual methods of going out to these meetings just to make sure that as many districts as we can reach know that this option is available to them. So we are asking the board to approve the regulations and authorize us to file them on an emergency basis so that we can get this in place as quickly as possible to provide the clarity to the school districts. Great, thank you very much. Any questions? Any public comment? No co comments. Great, thanks. May we have a motion on this item then, please? So moved. Thanks, Senator Leva. Thanks, Senator Roth. Moved by Senator Leva, seconded by Senator Roth. Ms. Jones, will you call the roll, please? All righty. Senator Wilk. Aye. Senator Leva. Aye. Senator Roth. Aye. Assemblymember O'Donnell. Aye. Assemblymember Cunningham. Aye. Assemblymember Burke. Aye. Juan Morales. Aye. Dan Kim. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. And that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We'll now move. Um, this last item is not an action item, but to our projected workload. Is there any questions on the 90 day workload? Any questions, Mr. Watanabe? Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. I think with that, we can adjourn our meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and we'll see you on November October 28th. October 28th. Great. Thanks, everyone. At four o'clock. At four. Take care. Four. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank you.